اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری وحل العقدت من لسانی یفقہ قولی ربی صدنی علما اللہم فقہنا فی الدین الہی آمین السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ جدی انشاءاللہ we are going to have our session number 11 And today we are going to talk about modesty, a treasure to value. So inshallah, let's begin. In our previous episode, we spoke about giving respect to elders, right? And there are different ways included in giving respect. For instance, we can initiate salam to them, offering our help to them, especially elderly people like our grandparents or the grandparents of our friends who require special assistance, right? So we can offer our help to them. And subhanAllah, using these opportunities is basically keys to unlock Jannah. These are basically opportunities for us to access Jannah. So we should consider them as opportunities rather than considering them as a burden. So that was a quick recap so that we can all assess ourselves in the light of Quran and Sunnah, whether we are respectful towards our elders or not, whether we are compassionate towards the young or not, do we honor the ones in need or not. So inshallah, this week, we will speak about haya, modesty. Just like cultivating excellent morals and good character is one of the primary objectives of Islam, modesty plays a fundamental role in beautifying these characters. Rasulullah said, every religion has its signature character trait. And the signature character trait of Islam is haya. Now, when we think about haya, when we think about modesty, Is it a feminine virtue, right? Meaning, is it something related to women wearing hijab and that's it? No, of course not. Yes, that's one of the aspects of portraying modesty. However, the term haya is much more comprehensive than that. Literally speaking, haya means feeling embarrassed of doing anything which is considerably wrong. So it's It's basically a self-controlling force that results with a fear of embarrassment, knowing that, an, uh, that a respected observer is watching us. So having this feeling, having this notion in mind that there's someone watching us 24-7, there's someone observing us 24-7 and feeling embarrassed to do any sin, that is haya. So for instance, if you go to a gathering, if you are in a party and you know that you are being recorded, just think about how careful you are going to be in terms of your actions, in terms of the words you use, right? In terms of the uh, way you act, in terms of the way we behave, right? We're very careful when we know that we are under um, surveillance, right? When we are monitored 24 seven, we're gonna be extra cautious. So when we have this, feeling a fear that I don't want to commit any sin. I don't want to mess up. I don't want to do anything wrong. Why? Because I don't want to face embarrassment of that sin in akhirah. This is basically haya, modesty. It's something that is reflected in our speech, dress, and conduct. In public, with regards to people, and in private, in regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is Haya. Now, let's move into the explanation of this word. So let's zoom into the word modesty. It basically has two elements to it. One is the physical manifestation of modesty, meaning what? That it's related to our outward appearance. And the other is the internal aspect to it. It deals with our emotional and psychological behavior. It deals with our thinking process. So the way we think plays a fundamental role in the way we act. If our thought process is indecent and the things we watch are inappropriate and the people who surround us often use 
in decent words, vulgar language, then that will affect the way we behave. It will impact our character. So number one, our eyes play a big role in practicing haya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Nur, and this is in eye number 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tell the believing men to lower their gaze and be modest. That is purer for them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is indeed aware of whatever they do. And then the next ayah says, and tell the believing woman, and tell the believing woman to lower their gaze and be modest and to display of their adornment only that which is apparent and to draw their veils over their chests and not to reveal their adornment. So as seen from this ayah of Quran, Islamic ethics tell us that modesty is a virtue not only for women, but for men as well. Modesty, haya, is not just something that women need to practice. It's something that men need to practice as well. Now that we have to, now that we have come to know about it, the question is, what should we start from? Where should we start from? So the first thing is the demeanor in terms of our dress code. So the first hukum tells us that we should lower our gaze, meaning we shouldn't watch anything. We shouldn't see anything which is inappropriate. And then in the next ayah, next part of the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the dress code. For instance, for women, the ideal dress code, Islamic dress code, is that we wear an extra layer of covering over our clothes and cover our whole body and wear a headscarf to cover our hair. Why is this injunction mentioned? So that we can be identified as Muslim women. What's the wisdom behind it? Let's do a comparative analysis of, say, for instance, a local product and an expensive branded product. If we analyze, the branded product is always placed and presented in a glass cubicle. Why is that so? So that everyone doesn't have access to it. Only the person in charge is able to access it, right? Who is it? The shopkeeper. Why is that so? Because the product is so valuable. The product is so precious. These branded products also come with a special tag, which provides all the details of the brand. Why is that so? So that people can easily identify the specific brand, right? On the other side, a local product has no special packaging and no tags. It's placed out on the shelves where everyone is able to touch it, try it out. And this makes the product get dirty as well right? Why is that so? Because it's cheap and invaluable. The same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the importance of women. The way Islam portrays women is that they are very precious. It's like a pearl in a shell. That's why it gives them a special dress code so that everyone can identify them as respectable Muslimas. Only the one like who is close to her, like her family members, can see her beauty, not everyone else. Why is that so? Because she is precious. She is valuable. And that's the why she is veiled. Hijab gives her protection. She's protected from other people's snide remarks. She's protected from their evil looks, right? It's a mode of protection as well as honor for her. So hijab basically is a crown of a Muslim. Hijab forces a man to look at a woman with respect rather than viewing her as an object. So people may assume that Muslim women are oppressed but alhamdulillah, just tell yourself that we are not. We are in fact 
honored. Alhamdulillah, when we walk out of our house wearing our hijab, covering ourselves, lowering our gaze, Alhamdulillah, we feel honored. We feel free. We do not feel oppressed. Alhamdulillah. Now that when we talk about modesty and haya, is it just the hijab that matters? It's not just the dress code. It's actually our entire attitude. It's actually our entire character, our entire demeanor. Hijab doesn't mean that we just cover ourselves. It also includes the way we act, the words we say, and what we think. So anytime we come across anything inappropriate, what do we do? As Muslims, we lower our gaze. So if we're watching something, we change the channel. If we're reading something, we flip the page of the magazine. We turn away. We do not enjoy staring at the opposite gender. Rather, what do we do? We look away. And subhanAllah, the criteria of hijab is not just to be followed in terms of the opposite gender. Even if it's the same gender, there are still few elements of haya that needs to be practiced. For instance, if we are at a water park, and there are girls who are wearing their swimsuits. Again, what do we do? We look down. We do not stare. Why? Because it's considered inappropriate. Even though it's the same gender, we still need to practice haya. Many a times we practice haya due to fear of people, right? We practice haya, we practice modesty due to the fear of public. Due to the fear of people and society, we act modestly. But when we're alone, we do whatever we like. Now, this is hypocritical. And this kind of hypocritical attitude will do us no good. It will not bring us any good. Because what is immodest one day in a secular society may be totally acceptable in another, right? So then what are we going to do? Will we change our morals according to the country we live in? Of course not right? We don't practice modesty according to the norms of a society. Rather, we practice it in a way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordained it to be. So the first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us was the dress code. And we already discussed that. What else is included in modesty? Our entire khuluq. So what comes in khuluq? our speech the way we interact with e with each other that needs haya as well many a times when we are together with friends and family we crack such inappropriate jokes that are totally filthy but why do we say it because we want to gain attention we want to entertain others so this kind of attitude should be corrected because our speech the way we interact actually affects our thinking process. It alters our actions as well. So the way we interact needs to portray haya too. Maybe our mode of interaction is moderate. However, at times we lose our temper and say things that we shouldn't have. Raising one's voice in the times of anger, while we're wanting our anger, using cuss words, Words, simply shows our lack of ability to control our anger. And the only outcome of it would be damaged relationships and resentment. So uncontrolled anger, for example, can lead us to verbal abuse and physical assault. That definitely goes against the elements of haya. So even when we speak, we have to pay utmost caution in regards to the words that we use because words once uttered cannot be taken back no matter how many apologies we present, right? So whether we are speaking to our parents or grandparents, whether we are addressing our teachers or employer, whether we are addressing our students or friends, Regardless of the fact who we talk to, young or old, rich or poor, we should practice haya in the way we interact and talk in a respectful way. Why is that so? Because 
the Prophet وسلم, said, let's revisit the hadith with which we started off this series. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-mu'minu al-qawiyyu khayrun wa ahabbu ila Allahi min al-mu'mini al-da'if. A strong believer is more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compared to a weak believer. So we think to ourselves that by raising our voices, arguing with elders and debating with them, we will portray ourselves as strong Muslimas, as confident people. But let us analyze that there's a difference between being confident and being overconfident, right? And overconfidence does not bring us any good. Overconfidence actually harms us more than it benefits us. So this hadith teaches us that we need to be a strong Muslim. And a strong Muslim is... Uh, the strength of Iman is only attained through taqwa, through the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how we can be a strong Muslim, right? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he enables us to practice haya so that we can strengthen ourselves in terms of Iman. Now, if we want to take a live example of haya, then we have the story of Yusuf alayhi salam in the Quran. And this story has many life lessons for us to follow. What do we learn in this surah? That the wife of Aziz in whose house Yusuf alayhi salam was staying, she had a crush on Yusuf alayhi salam. Now, the wife of Aziz is who? Is she a normal person? No, she is someone who is rich, she's beautiful, and she's noble. And Yusuf salam himself was at the prime age of youth. So even he was young, smart, and handsome. If Yusuf salam wished, he could have submitted himself to her desires, right? But what did he do? He feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He couldn't do something which was immodest, something which was haram. So what did he do? He chose prison over freedom and he turned away from her he turned away from her right and this kind of situation can happen with any one of us for instance when you see that your inbox is full of valentine messages you decide to shun the sin by blocking all the guys. You stay away from social media for quite some time. You close your Instagram account. You switch off your phone for a few days. And when you do that, it's going to seem to you that you're living in a prison. You're going to feel that you're living without oxygen, right? It's going to be a big step for you. The tasks it's gonna seem very daunting, but guess what? It's okay because you chose to make this sacrifice for who? To please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you do that, inshallah, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will please you with mountains of hasanat on the day of qiyamah, on the day of judgment. You may regret taking the step right now, and it's going to seem very difficult right now, but soon you will realize that this investment was worth it. SubhanAllah. So we have to be very careful. Initially, we had to go out to meet someone personally in order to commit haram behind closed doors, right? But now with media and technology, all we got to do is use our tablets and cell phones and our screens can act as closed doors for us, right? We don't even have to leave our house in order to commit haram because haram can access us. So what do we do in that case? Anytime we use social media platforms, we do not act naive. Rather, we stay cautious about our surroundings and practice haya even when we are online. Practice haya whether we are in person or online. But then 
we think to ourselves that technology, nothing wrong is going to ever happen to me, right? That's the kind of confidence we have. That's the kind of surety we have that nothing of that sort will ever happen to me. Well, alhamdulillah, if that's the case, it's it's good, mashallah. But believe it or not, the world that we live in, the kind of world that we live in right now, is a lot more dangerous than it used to be a century ago, right? If we compare our lives to the life back then, a century ago or 1400 years ago, there was less access to haram, less access to sinful activities compared to what we have right now compared to all the available choices that we have right now, compared to all the available temptations and lusts that we are presented with, right? So we have to be very careful. Now let's take an example of Instagram. It's a very fun app, right? That provides an easy way to share pictures and be entertained. But at the same time, there are dangers to it as well, right? For instance, when we post pictures on Instagram, we often see a like or a view from a user that we don't recognize. So if something like that happens, make sure to block that user immediately. Why is that? Because no matter how many safety filters you may add to your apps, once a picture is posted, it's gone. It's gone. Anyone can crop it, use it and misuse it for their own benefit. Whose loss will it be? Our loss, your loss, my loss, isn't it? So let's be extra cautious in this regard and practice haya against the temptations on screen. Because the criteria of haya is something which is not only applied to the things we post, but it also applies to the pigs we see, to the things we watch. People often post glamorous, romanticized pictures online, which often lead to a marital conflict amongst couples. Why is that so? Because we think that we do not have ideal marriages as others. We do not have the ideal lives like others. But is that the reality all the time? We don't even know the dark side of the picture. No one knows if the couple had a fight right before they took that picture. All we see is the apparent and we become upset. Researchers say that 15% of married couples believe that social media is a problem in their relationship. 16% of married couples admit their use of Facebook has caused significant jealousy in their marriage. 14% of married adults admit that they routinely look through their partner's social media accounts, primarily looking for evidence of infidelity. So social Social media platforms like Facebook or Instagram aren't haram per se, right? That's not what we mean to say. But the way we use it needs a lot of speculation. Yes, it's true that many a times we use these social media platforms to rest and relax after having an exhausted day of work. But let's ask ourselves, is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? Right? So let's learn to lower our gaze any time we come through anything inappropriate and turn away from these time wasters if they are becoming a priority for us at the expense of endangering our relationships. Why is that so? Because it's not worth it. It's just not worth it. In multiple surveys, people have reported experiencing depression if they spend two or more hours a day on Instagram. Why is that so? Did you ever give it a thought? Because when we scroll through the pictures of our friends and family, we start comparing our lives with theirs and we feel like we fall short. We see a group of people together and we feel left out. We see people going on amazing vacations 
and we feel envious. We see people buying expensive stuff and we feel deprived. And this is a huge problem among teens, amongst youth. And it's not surprising, right? That's what the social media apps does to us, whether it's Instagram or Facebook. Each comes with its pros and cons. So we have to be very careful. And of course, subhanAllah, there are people whose marriages are ending up in divorce. What's the reason? One of the primary reasons is because we have become too busy to address our responsibilities. Either we are too busy with our work, job, or school, or we're just too busy talking to our virtual friends. We don't have time for our families. We don't have time for the real people who live around us. Why is that so? Because the element of having the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gone missing. If we have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we have the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that one day we are going to be questioned, then we will make sure that we try our best to fulfill our role as a daughter, as a spouse, as a daughter-in-law, as a mother, as a student, as a teacher, as an employee, or as an employer, as a good citizen, in order to make our homes a blessed home, in order to make our community a blessed community. However, when our center of life becomes our own selves and the fulfillment of our desires, then we will not care if we yell or scream at our spouse. We'll not care if we break family ties with our in-laws. We'll not care if our children get neglected. We'll not care if we give time to our parents or not. And then after doing all those blunders, at times, astaghfirullah, we even justify our mistakes, right? We prove other people wrong, despite the fact that we know it's our own mistake. That's where we need to practice haya. Aren't we embarrassed to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he questions us? Aren't we fearful to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he questions us? What's the end result? If we are careless from our duties and our responsibilities, what's the end result? Increase in divorce rate? Children being deprived from receiving parental love? Families breaking apart? And high demand for senior homes, right? And that's something we actually see, right? That's actually something we're able to witness in a Muslim community, in our societies. And what's the reason behind it? There are definitely mistakes that needs to be corrected. Who are doing those mistakes? We are right? We are doing those mistakes. So we need to correct them. Right now, mashallah, since you are all young, you may not understand some of the things we just mentioned in today's class. But as you grow old and reach adulthood, you will realize that there are multiple things that you have to manage, right? Time for worship, time for work, family, relationships, lots of things will require your attention and life will seem pretty challenging. And that's when you have to question yourself, what are your priorities? If we are career oriented, we will have to make sure that we do not prioritize our career over our family. We have to learn to balance because our body has rights upon us. Our family has rights upon us. Our spouse, our children, our parents, our in-laws, our relatives, they all have rights upon us. And we have to learn to fulfill their hukuk. We need to learn to honor their rights. Why? Because we will be questioned about it. 
on the day of judgment, we will be questioned about our duties. Did we play our role as an ideal Muslim or not? No doubt that families go through rifts. No doubt that married couples go through arguments. They fight sometimes as well. But the question is, are we ready to compromise, right? We shouldn't always expect the husband to say sorry. At times, we should be ready to apologize as well. Why is that important? Because the kind of example we set in front of our children today, that's what they are going to implement in future when they grow up. If they see you compromising sometime, then they will do the same when they get married. But if they see you always trying to prove your point right, always being adamant, then that's the kind of adult they will grow up to be. Because life is not ideal. This dunya is not perfect. We may think about it as if it's perfect, right? We may perceive it to be perfect, but the reality is that it's not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined a known measure for everything, meaning according to his wisdom and according to his knowledge, he gives to his servants whatever is decreed for them. Sometimes we want something immediately and we get it. And sometimes it is delayed, right? We're not given that particular blessing at our desired time. Why is that so? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows when that particular blessing is good for us. When is it best for us to have it? At times, we're not given our exact wish. We're given a different substitute. And even that is khair for us, right? Everything has its own hikmah. Everything has its wisdom. And even if we do get all our desires fulfilled in the exact manner we wish, we will notice that later down the line, we will start developing complaints. For example, you may be able to marry the Romeo you wished for, right? You wish to get married to Prince Charming, and subhanAllah, your wish was granted. Your dua was accepted. But subhanAllah, over the years, when your husband gains extra weight, extra pounds, and start getting gray hair prior to old age, you may feel that he wasn't the best fit for you, right? He wasn't Prince Charming after all, right? You may be able to buy your dream house, but when your best friend purchases a better house than you, then suddenly your dream house that you always wished for, it suddenly starts looking dull. You may be able to raise intellectual and successful children just like you wished for. But guess what? If they are far from Hidayah, then it's going to hurt. You're going to feel that your dreams just got shattered. And the fact of the matter is that even if each and every single dua of ours is fulfilled, we will still be never satisfied. We will still be never content. And that's the reality of dunya. The life of this world can never be the best. Either dunya will fade out or we will die before we get to enjoy it. So the real enjoyment is the enjoyment of Akhirah. And in order to enjoy the accessories of Jannah, the mansions and real estate of Jannah, what do we do? We need to work hard now. We need to work hard now in this present moment. How do we do that? By following the Quran and Sunnah. So as we go on, subhanAllah, let's promise ourselves that no matter whatever we do, wherever we live, we have to live according to the desire of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to learn to fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to learn 
or try our best to fulfill the rights of the people around us. And that's how we can work for our akhirah. We may not be able to see all our desires getting fulfilled, but inshallah, our desires will be given to us in the best shape and form in Jannah. So anytime you come across temptations or evil desires, tell yourself that before I proceed towards any haram action, any sinful message, any lustful text, any meeting which is inappropriate, before I set out to go on a date, I should tell myself that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a halal option to fulfill all our desires. What is it? It's marriage. Now you may think to yourself that, subhanAllah, I like someone, but I'm just 13. I'm just 15. I cannot get married right now. It's okay. Make dua that if, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks that guy is best for you, that person is good for you, then inshallah, you're going to get him. But we shouldn't approach any thing which is inappropriate, anything which is despised, anything which is considered haram. We have to be very cautious in terms of the actions we do, in terms of the choices we make. And if we practice haya in terms of our relationships, in the way we interact with each other, in our character, in our demeanor, in the way we dress up, if we practice haya in every single thing, Inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to answer your dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you the best in dunya and in jannah. Inshallah. So anytime you come across any evil temptation, any lustful desire, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants you a good spouse, an ideal spouse, a loving and helpful spouse who can be your partner in this world and in akhirah. And even if that's not the case, just like we spoke about, don't worry about it. Just be patient and again make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because life is not perfect. Of course, there are going to be tests. Of course, there's going to be compromise in a marriage. Of course, there are going to be challenges. So make dua, be patient and Insha'Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us with the best in akhirah. So what's the crux of the matter? The summary of today's session is that haya is not just an attire. It is an entire way of life, right? In today's session, we discussed about the virtues of haya. We learned that haya is not something which is only portrayed in our dress code, but it's something which needs needs to be manifested in our speech, the way we interact, what we see online, the kind of hobbies we indulge in. Everything requires haya, right? The kind of friends who accompany us, everything requires haya. What are our preferences? What is our choice in terms of choosing a friend, choosing a spouse? Everything needs speculation. What is our thinking process? Everything requires haya. So it's basically a character trait that needs to be embodied in all our actions. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us so that we can become the kind of Muslim ummah that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam envisioned us to be. So before we conclude our session for today, I would like to share a true story with you about a young boy in the time of Umar radiallahu anhu. And we all know Umar radiallahu an, right? He was a companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the second khalifa of Islam, right? After Abu Bakr radiallahu an. So during his caliphate, during the caliphate of Umar radiallahu an, there was a young boy, a teenager, a youth, who would often come to his study circles, right? And he had an old father who used to live with him. So either he would be taking care of the errands of his dad 
or he would be attending the study circles of Umar radiallahu an. He would be attending the halaqa of Umar radiallahu an. Because of course, this is the time when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has passed away. Abu Bakr radiallahu an is not alive anymore. So basically, he's coming to the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to learn the Quran and Sunnah. So as he would come from his home and go to the masjid, or as he would go from the masjid and go towards his home to take care of his father, on the way, during his journey, he would come across a young girl, a young girl, a beautiful girl, who would desire him to be with her, to commit a sinful activity with her. And every time he would see her, he would turn away from her and leave. Any time he would come across in sinful thought, he would turn away from her and leave. And one day, subhanAllah, one day, and this is totally from the whispers of shaitan because shaitan is always after us, right? He wants to make a slip. He's always after us so that we are tempted by our desires and we ultimately go to Jahannam, right? So one day, Shaitan whispered to him to go to that girl and talk to her. Be with that girl, accompany her, be friends with her. And even if a relationship can be formulated, then be in a relationship with her, it's okay. So what did he do? He went to the girl, and said that, okay, fine. I am gonna give in to your desire. And as they are walking together, so the girl is in front and the guy, this teenager, this young guy is behind her. Like they're walking and there's distance between them. He remembers an ayah of Quran. And this ayah is in Surat Araf. He recites to himself, Surely when the God-fearing are touched by any instigation from shaitan, they become conscious of Allah and at once they discern the reality. They analyze and acknowledge the reality. And as soon as this boy thought of this ayah, he passed out. He fainted. Just like that. And subhanAllah, this, this girl is, is worried. She's in a panic mode. So she goes and calls her dad that something went wrong and this boy just fainted. So of course, there were no, there was no 911 at that time. But subhanAllah, the father came and he took the boy to his house and he um, put some water on him and he tried to wake him up. And the boy got his consciousness back. And he narrated to his father this incident. And the father is like, what happened to you? What, what went wrong? How did you pass out? And the boy said that there was this girl who called me to come to her house. And as I was going to her house, this ayah came to my mind. And I became so fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I just passed out. I just cannot couldn't I just couldn't believe that I was about to fall into sin I was about to fall into temptations and I was that close to committing a haram action as soon as I thought about it I just passed out and I fainted and while he was saying this he passed out again subhanallah believe it these people these individuals they were so righteous it's not like how you and me talk right we talk and talk and talk. We attend halaqas on and on and on. But subhanAllah, you know, there is no change. Astaghfirullah. Or there's very little change. So this boy, as he's narrating the story to his father, he passes out again. But this time, he didn't just pass out. He actually died. He actually died. And subhanAllah, his his father is crying, subhanAllah, to see the taqwa and the God consciousness of this young boy, of this son. And he's just weeping and 
crying and he goes to Umar radiallahu an and he narrates this incident to him. That subhanAllah, he didn't even commit haram. He didn't even, uh, you know, initiate haram. He didn't even do a little bit of haram. He just thought about that haram action. And as soon as he thought of this ayah, he passed out at first and then he eventually died. And Umar radiallahu an is of course, subhanAllah, in awe. And he is weeping to see the taqwa of this young individual. Anyway, subhanAllah, the next day, they all gather together to pray Salatul Janaza on him. The prayer is conducted, the funeral is done, and they all go to bury this boy. They all go to bury this boy. And once he is buried, once he is in his grave and Umar radiallahu an puts the dust on his face. He recites the ayah of Surah Rahman, which is Waliman Khafa Maqama Rabbihi Jannatan. And for the one who is fearful of having to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for him there will be two gardens in Jannah. Not just one, two gardens. And some people even interpret as two levels of Jannah. So Umar radiallahu an, he thinks about this boy and he recites this ayah as he is dropping the last portions of dust on his body, on his dead body. And subhanAllah, a voice cries out from his qabr, from his grave. Who's this voice? Who this voice is of? This boy, this very boy who just died, he speaks out from the grave. After he has passed away, after he has died, this boy says, Ya Umar, you said something which is so right. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already given me two gardens in Jannah. Meaning, I already have received the good news that I will be given two gardens in Jannah. SubhanAllah. And it's a miracle which is recorded in the books of Sira in the books of history, that this individual, this dead person actually spoke from his grave. And this has a moral lesson for us. And subhanAllah, for all the people, there is a deep, profound lesson for all of us to learn that if we fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then whether we get the reward of it in dunya or not, we will definitely get the reward of it in Jannah. And what was the simple action of this boy? It was not fasting every single day. It was not praying for the entire night, every single night, praying Salatul Tahajjud. What was the beautiful action of this boy, which was complimented, which was praised, because of which this boy was exonerated? It was his haya. It was his modesty. And the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he doesn't want to do anything immodest that would lead to the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are able to practice this kind of haya in our lives so that we can have a beautiful life in Jannah, so that we are able to attain the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that on the day of judgment, when we meet our Prophet, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he is pleased with us to see us, to meet us, that we are from his ummah. We are part of his ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this meeting a beautiful one. Amen. So insha'Allah, we will conclude our session for today. Jazakumullahul khairan kathira for attending. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka, nastaghfiruka dhna tubu ilayk. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adab al-nar. Allahumma anis wahshadhi fi qabri. Allahumma alhamni bal qur'an al-azim. Waj'alhu li imama wa nuran wa hudan wa rahma. اللهم ذكرني منهما نسيت وعلمني منهما جهلت وارزقني تلاوته آناء الليل وآناء النهار واجعله لي حجة يا رب العالمين آمين سمانين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته